good to be here. Thank you so much. So to start off, first of all, I'd like you to give us one very short message about the significance of this day, June 12th. Well, um, it is the day that uh, signifies the awakening of Nigerians to um, their desire for democracy and all the freedoms that democracy um, brings. Um, so that's really it in a nutshell. It's a day when um, events happened that brought to the fore um, the yearning of Nigerians for, for democracy. After several years of military rule, Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, uh, there's some people that obviously know you across the world, but there's a, a, a huge generation of Nigerians, uh, Yoruba, uh -huh. uh, members Can of the, the Yoruba nation. Hello, did you hear me? I, yes, ma'am. I, I just thanked you. I said thank you so much for that. And um, I was going to say that there are some people that do know you across the world because we're being watched globally at the moment. But there's a huge chunk of um, the younger generation probably have heard the name Awolowo or Awolowo Dusumu and don't know you or never um, put a face to the name. Um, it would be very uh, wonderful for us to have you. Please let us know who is Dr. Ambassador Olatokumbo Awolowo Dusumu. Well, um, I am a 72-year-old mother, grandmother. Um, I am a medical by profession. I was born 72 years old, 72 years ago, in Ibadan, to the family of Chief Obafemi Awolowo and HID Awolowo. Actually, it, it was a Wednesday that I was born, and I was born night. So um, Papa was about to leave for Owo. Interestingly, he had a case the following day in Owo, and he preferred to travel overnight. So just as he was about to enter his car, um, he heard the cry of a newborn baby, and that was me. Um, I went to school in Ibadan. I went to um, a, a um, kindergarten school, children home school, uh, run by Chief Mrs. Ogunlesi at the time. Um, and then I went to UMC demonstration school, which was a public school. And I was fortunate to be one of, one of the people that pioneered the free education uh, program in the Western region. I was um, one of the students at the time in UMC. And from there, I went to St. Anne's School in Ibadan. And thereafter, um, I was about to sit for a direct entrance into the uni University of Ibadan. Um, but the day before the exam, I got a message that I should not bother to turn up for the exam because I was too young. That was the time when the Western Region crisis was raging, and it was really probably at its zenith at that time. And so, my parents decided that it was that my sister and I, uh, my immediate senior sister, Mrs. Otumba Yodile Shoyode, late now, 
uh, that both of us should just be packed off to the United Kingdom. So we, I went, we went and I attended a school called Felix Stowe College in Suffolk. And there I did my A-levels and then I um, gained entrance into the University of Bristol where I studied medicine. I graduated in 1972 and I came back home for my house jobs and then I continued working um, at the UCH in Ibadan. I got married, moved to Lagos, um, worked at the Lagos University Teaching Hospital, actually the College of Medicine, the, the Department of Public Health. And from there, I moved to the Nigerian Ports Authority um, Medical Division, where I developed an interest in occupational medicine. Then I went to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, a school within the University of London. And I did a master's degree in occupational medicine and also did a diploma in industrial health. And I came back into private practice after which, um, well, I was in private practice when Papa died. And um, in, that was in 1987. And then my career got um, interrupted because I was... Um, nominated into the Constituent Assembly at the time in it. Um, and from there, I just got sucked into politics and there into Bafemi Awolo and set up the Awolo Foundation. It's what I was doing. And I was the ambassador of Nigeria to the Dome of the Nets. Um, after which I decided to go back to my profession. And I worked in the UK for several years. Uh, came back a few years ago, uh, started back uh, with the Willow Foundation. And that's what I've been doing, um, apart from uh, helping to steer the Nigerian Tribune, the African newspapers of Nigeria. So that's who I am. That's what I do. Um, I'm a very, very, person, very introverted, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> very reserved. It's amazing. I'm that very you, quiet. Just, thank, you, <laughs> thank you so much, Ma, for that wonderful um, capture or recap of um, yourself and you know your childhood and background, etc. Um, I'm sure there's been a lot of fun memories, even whilst you were recapping. Uh, but one thing you just said now is that you're you're very quiet, you're very introverted, and very reserved. Um, are you sh are you sure about that, Ma? You've got the Aulawa blood <laughs> in your veins. Um, neither Chief Obafemi Aulawa nor HID were introverts <laughs> or or quiet. And, and being someone that has also had um, uh, the opportunity to veer into politics yourself, um, maybe that kind of must have stripped you of the little quietness that you probably have been guarding all your life. <laughs> well, that's how I like to describe myself. Other people probably see me, see me differently, but uh, you know, um, I like to think I'm quiet, but sometimes um when i have something to say or when something really irks me i can't stop myself from speaking so you know maybe i'm somewhere in and, between and and i would say that marks you indeed as your father's daughter and talking about your 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 beloved dad um i'm going to go on to my next question which is about the our law foundation we cannot talk about um the you know what we have you know obviously all fighting for today to see um an africa and a nigeria and a yoruba nation that is properly governed 
and um, where democracy is held sway. We do know that the Our Law Foundation has those ethos. Um, why was it set up? And what exactly is it that you do at the foundation and your role as executive director? So that's three questions in one man. Over to you. Okay. Um, when Papa died, um, I had no intention of going into public life at all. But then, as I said, I went into the Constituent Assembly. I was sucked into politics. I was in politics for a few years. And it dawned on me that Papa's legacy um, was of such importance, such significance, that it would be a shame if we allowed it to die. So I had, looking back now, the erroneous impression that I could carry on that legacy through politics, but that didn't work. But the feel, feeling remained that uh, that legacy was very, very important. And as far as I was concerned, Papa translated from a partisan politician to a universal idea on May 9, 1987, because I believed that his thoughts, his mission, his vision, his philosophy uh, cut across party lines because it was about development through the development making the individual the center piece of the development program. And I just believed that any politician or any government official functionary worth his or her salt would see that as the foundation, as a plank upon which they could build. So um, the idea of the Aulo Foundation and I thought that was a perfect way to, to reposition Papa and his ideas in a non-partisan way, in a way that it would be accessible and available to all shades of political opinion, everybody and anybody who wish this country well and who wishes this country progress. So that's why the foundation was set up. And I, in, in putting together a board of trustees, um, I and a few others that were working with me at the time, we decided that we needed to cut across the entire nation all nationalities within Nigeria, all shades of political opinion in Nigeria. So we had General Gowan as the chairman. We had uh, Chief Emeka Ojuko as a member of the board. Chief Abiola was a member of the board. Um, Chief Bolaike, of course, was on the board. And some intellectuals were there, Chief, uh, no, well, he's a chief, Professor Ladipo Akinkubwe, and so on. And we had even Alaji Maitama Sule was on the board. Um, in order that we could have access to all those networks, to bring them together to talk about uh, the problems of Nigeria and the great issues of the day. That was why um, the foundation was set up. And mercifully, we got the support of the federal government at the time, who were massively supported by the federal government at the time and state governments at the time. Um, and 
once it was set up, once we had the funding, uh, it was now a question of how do we proceed? Um, and I just felt that we needed to do what Papa used to do. Look at the great issues, the, the trending issues, the, 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 the issues of the day and bring people together from di different um, angles to discuss it and perhaps come to a consensus. And that was what we did for many years. We had annual dialogues. We had a dialogue on the economy, a dialogue on the way forward, a dialogue on leadership, a dialogue on democracy and the rule of law, um, on poverty, on education, on health, name it. We had this dialogue here, uh, lasting from anything from one day to three days. And um, we, we invited people from all corners of Nigeria and beyond. And um, we had the support of foreign governments. The, the British High Commission was supportive. The US Embassy was supportive, Ford Foundation, and so on. So um, it was, uh, and we had annual meetings on the budget as well, you know, analyzing the budget and, and so on. So, um, so that was what we did in order to keep this legacy alive um, and in order to, to bring generations that probably don't know Papa to the knowledge of what he stood for. And as the years have gone on, it, it has become clear that our mission at this point is just to sustain and protect that legacy um, in such a way that generations that are coming behind can have the option of looking at it again. Um, if it's dead, then they can't have a look at it. But if it's still alive, if at some point in the future, a group of young people who want to be in public office, want to engage in public life in Nigeria, feel that, okay, why don't we try a different approach if they feel the current approach is not working well enough why don't we try a different approach there's oh there's somebody called you for Bafemiaulo why don't we look at what he stood for and if they wish then they could um, make use of it fortunately papa was easy to to um, his legacy was easy to sustain because he wrote a lot. He was an intellectual. He was a thinker. He was a philosopher. He was all of those actually first before being a politician, in my view. Politics for him, in my humble opinion, was but uh, uh, an avenue. Uh, a, it's an avenue by which to actualize his thoughts and his and his projects and programs for people. So it was easy, and it's still easy. His thoughts are still there in print, and uh, we try to carry on, uh, just maintaining that legacy and protecting it. Um, a lot of people might want to use it for partisan political ends, which is fine if it works for them, but we need to be sure that that legacy um, actually rises above partisanship. And it is something that um, that is still so relevant at this time. 
And as for myself, um, as an executive director, well, I, I remain the executive director. I um, pilot the affairs. We don't have a bureaucracy in the foundation. I never had roots because I knew that funding a bureaucracy would very quickly become a problem. Um, and so we worked on an ad hoc. Um, we, whenever we had a, we had a committee that worked on it. And once their work is done, done, that's it. And we've been very fortunate because although Papa was not stupendously wealthy, um, what he had was actually greater than, than material wealth. And that is the goodwill. And so people we've invited to work with us on, on programs and projects have done so practically for free. In fact, actually for free many times. And the rest of the time, maybe just a stipend for their transportation and their living. In fact, we've gotten away with, with so much uh, for so little. So um, it's been it's been quite easy to to do it. Thank you very much indeed for taking us down memory lane from the time that um, you and um, the other members decided to set up the foundation. Thank you for explaining to to us what the foundation really means. There's something that you said that I picked up. Uh, you said. Um, um, that your beloved dad, Chief Obafemi Awolowo, um, as we all know him, translated from um, this earth into a global idea. And immediately, another person that has actually done that, in fact, I would say that he's probably in, um, in very great company because we'll be thinking of people like um, uh, Madiba, Nelson Mandela, who also, he, he was about fighting for his people. And um, he also did the same, you know, thing and translated somebody like um, Mahatma Gandhi. Um, the list goes on of, of people like that, um, Mother Teresa, people that actually um, took it upon themselves to ensure uh, the betterment of their people, of their nations and the world at large. Um, having said that, would you say then that all the ideologies that um, um, was inherited from the great sage, Chief Obafe Miaolo, now focusing on Nigeria and especially the Yoruba nation, because you also let us know that you had quite a number of um, leaders, you know, within Nigeria itself from the various um, uh, states and regions that came to support. My question is, did the government of the day, obviously there have been different governments since you've been running the foundation, have any of them at all taken on board the great ideas and suggestions and advices that yourself and the entire group have come up with? Is there any one particular time that there was something you said, look, um, this is what we have come up from the foundation, or this is what we have observed. I would love you to have a look at it and hopefully implement it for the betterment of us as a nation. Has there been any time that something like that has happened? Because it's very important for us to know. Um, it may have happened, but I am not aware. I'm not. I'm not aware that anything that emanated from the Awolowo Foundation has been embraced in government. Uh, I'm not aware. That is not to say that it hasn't been done, you know, quietly um, behind the scenes. It's, it's possible, but I, I'm not aware. Thank you, ma'am. Now you have been. Um, drawn into the forays of, of politics um, 
even though you know your your first love is obviously medicine because we always know that um doctors and medical practitioners are born not made you, it will be in you to go into that because it's a, it's, a, it's a profession of caring and it's from the heart and then you get yanked from there into you know, the turbulent um forays of politics are you able to just share a few things with us about your the highs and lows, your experiences as both a politician and also when you became ambassador? Yes. Um, well, my uh, my foray into politics, as I said, was through the Constituent Assembly uh, in 1988 to 1989, and thereafter. Um, I ventured into partisan politics. Um, I have to say that um, the sum total experience was uh, was traumatic <laughs> um, for for many reasons. Um, some of which was probably due to my own naivety. Um, and assumptions that I went into it with. Um, but um, the reality was quite different. And so um, I, I, I ran into troubled waters um, in the most unexpected quarters from the most unexpected people. Um, but you know, it, it, it was a it was a learning curve, a steep one, but a learning curve all the same. And I'm I'm grateful that I went through it. What I do know though is that when I emerged um, in politics, there was great excitement at the grass. The ones that I knew that to know me. They were very happy. I suppose they transferred the kind of love that they had for Papa to me at the time and the expectation was very high. Um, and I remember very vividly, um, I, I live in, in, in the mainland in Lagos and at the, during my campaigns, you know, when I when I tried to um, contest for governorship in Lagos State, um, I I remember there was a lady. She 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 was hawking fruit, you know, pineapple, purple, and she she her entire. <coughs> Her entire outlay, I don't think, could have been up to 3,000 Naira, I'm not sure. But she was passing by my house, saw the posters, and, uh, and asked to come in. And the, the gate man was going to stop her, and I, I said, no, let her come in. And she came in. She put down her tray and she emptied it for me hmm. she was weeping she was crying she, and she said you know the, she remembered papa and all that he did and if uh, his child could do anything like that they would be very very fortunate and so on that i will never forget um i tried to give her money and she refused she refused to the end and, and and she left the other the other um experience that was um there was i can't remember there was some crisis there were burning tires on the Kurudu road and i couldn't get back home and i had i made a detour through um Bariga and Shomulu, Igobi, that's that kind. And the whole place, there was no movement. 
So I decided to, to get down from the car and walk, make my way home. And as I got down, one of the young men just noticed and said, ah, Omo Baba, this is Papa's child. And I said, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. And she said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll lead you, I'll pilot you home. And as we went, they, they, they got, they, more and more of them joined. And by the time I got <laughs> home, it was a huge crowd. <laughs> The neighborhoods passed because they were all carrying leaves and all sorts of things. And all the neighborhoods, the people were peeping out of their windows and doors and wondering what was going on. And they saw me right to my house. And when I got home, I, I wanted to give them something to say thank you. They said, no way. And they they just went off happily and you know, went off happily. So um that those kind of experiences uh, gave me great joy that um papa left such an impression such an impression um on one occasion this is the final one there are so many of them i'll put them in my book there was <laughs> one occasion we made a detour through <laughs> through Diaraba, mushi and stuff and i was in the Aula Foundation vehicle with the logo on the sides, and we we there were narrow roads, of course, and there was a table tennis. Um, there, there were two young boys were playing table tennis beside the road, and one of them looked behind him and said to the other, "Ah, Moto Baba." Ah. Now. <laughs> The other one didn't ask who the Baba, he understood without having to, <laughs> to, to be explained to. So, so those, those kinds of experiences were very, very, very heartwarming. But, you know, then you had to contend with other politicians and that just didn't work. And, you know, I just felt that it wasn't for me. So, but I'm glad I went through it. I'm glad I went through it. Um, I I learned a lot. Um, I learned a lot about human nature. I learned a lot about um, politics in Nigeria uh, and and its foibles. So that was good. Um, and then I went to be the executive director of the Aulo Foundation and I was appointed ambassador. Before I was appointed ambassador at the foundation, I was appointed a member of the International Committee of the Council on Founders, which is based in Washington. Um, it's an umbrella body for mm -hmm. a thousand foundations worldwide. and. Um, and that was a fantastic experience. I used to go for meetings with them and I learned an awful lot uh, about the third sector, which it is called, which can do such great things um, without having to be in government. Um, and then when I was appointed ambassador, that, that was, <laughs> that was, a surprise. How did you feel when you got it the was call? A complete surprise. I remember. Well, I, it was a Saturday afternoon. I was about to leave my bedroom. I I was about to go and visit. I remember it was Chief Mubakris in hospital. I think he was attacked at home at that time, and he was in hospital. And I was on my way to go and visit him in hospital and as i crossed the threshold of my bedroom my private telephone rang in my room and i thought who could be calling me and i went back and i picked up the call and it was somebody i won't name names and he said he was calling from the president and I said okay well um, <laughs> 
what can I do for you? Well, your name came up as a nominee for Ambassador High Health because it, it was completely out of the blue. And it just was, I don't think at all, my plans in a complete direction. I said, okay, I really didn't know what to say. Mama is not in the country at the time. I have to talk to her. So we left it at that. I tried to call my mind the UK for some strange reason. I couldn't get her for about a week or two. I just couldn't get through to her. And so I just forgot all about it. And I myself was about to travel out of the country. So I, uh, I just forgot about it and left. It was while I was in London brother, my late brother, called me one evening and said, well, <clears throat> um, he called and then Chief Shegun Shoba, who was then governor of Ogo State, called and said, well, the list is coming out tomorrow. Your name is on it. And I said, well, <laughs> I because I was sure there must have been so many people lobbying for this thing. And since they hadn't heard from me, I'm sure they must have, you know, picked somebody else who appeared a lot keener. So, so that was how it happened. And I came back home for screening and all the rest of it. And then I actually went uh, on posting. And my experience there was brilliant. It was, it was, um also hard in some um, ladies and gentlemen i think um because it's it's raining in night so here in the UK, so we're trying to um, sort out some challenges there. There's nothing one can do about the weather. Um, the weather is controlled, but I'm sure um, the um, technical director, Mr. Adi Thomas, will be able to sort that out very, very quickly. Um, once again, if you're just tuning in, uh, it's the Arise Conversations talk show. And um, I am your host and uh, producer, Her Royal Highness Princess Mariah Deung Adi Deung Sholari. My guest today is none other than the amazing, very brilliant Dr. Ambassador Ola Tokumbo Aulo Odusumu, who is a medical practitioner by profession, a former ambassador of Nigeria to the Netherlands, uh, executive director of the um, Obafemi Aulo Foundation, and somebody who's also forayed into the avenues of politics, uh, an administrator of repute, um, an amazing and astute um, thought leader and um, a speaker. Um, we're just waiting for our um, technical director to sort things out. In the interim, we'll go on a short break and we'll be back very, very soon. Don't, please stay tuned. It's Odua Legends on Heritage Multimedia Television, beaming live and direct to you from the United Kingdom. See you very soon. Don't go away. Every night in my dreams, I see you. I...
Yeah, welcome back. It's um, 12th of June, uh, where we remember Demog where we remember Chief M. Kwabiola and also what Nigeria Nigerians refer to as democracy. Uh, it's uh, still the Odua legends where we bring you uh, personalities from uh, across the Odua region, which is the Yoruba nation of Nigeria as a Western part of Nigeria. And then um, we just ask them a variety of questions and enable them to share with us from their vast experiences in their various professions and um, in life generally. Um, today we have as our special guest, Dr. Olato Kumbo Awilo Odusumu, uh, the last daughter of um, the late sage chief Obafemi Awilowo Dusumu, uh, Awilowo. Uh, uh, that w widely across Nigeria is uh, usually and popularly referred to as Papa Au or Papa Aulo. Uh, Dr. Tokumo Dosumo um, is the executive director of the Obafemi Aulo Foundation presently that she runs and oversees its day to day running. Uh, she's been a politician before, she served in the National Assembly, um, she has also been a former ambassador to the Netherlands. Um, most importantly, she's a medical direct, a medical practitioner, a medical doctor patient, and that is obviously her first love. And um, for people who know her, she's exceptionally brilliant and very cerebral in her work. Um, talking about uh, Chief Obafemi Awolo, uh, we can't but not remember uh, some of his legacies, one of them being the setting up and launching of uh, the great WNTV uh, first in Africa. That's the first television station ever in Africa and number five in the world. A lot of people don't know that. So the first in the world to have television was America. The second was Great Britain, as it was called then. The third was West was Germany, Western Germany. The fourth was Australia. And guess who was the fifth? not Nigeria, Western Nigeria. So Western Nigeria, because we're in regions at the time. So we were called WNTV, WNBS, first in Africa, number five in the world. And the day this particular station was launched is 31st of October, 1959. So it was a year to Nigeria getting its independence um, as a sovereign nation. I'm going to ask um, our director, Mr. Adi Thomas, television, to kindly just play a bit, you know, for us. We've listened to Dr. Tokumbo Aulaudusumu, how she's spoken about the legacies of um, Papa Aulawo and uh, the various things that um, he did um, during his time with, of course, his team of, of, of uh, political colleagues and leaders in the Western region. Now, this one was one of the biggest things that happened. And by the way, um, history has it that this WNTV was set up within three months, not years, three months. So if the Western region of Nigeria, far back in 1959, you know, were able to set this up, under the leadership of, of Chief Obafemi Awolowo, then one begins to think. So I want you all to just sit back and watch this clip. Maybe it will enable us to think about the way forward, because this is going to lead me into the next question I'm going to ask Dr. Tukumba Awolowo Dusumo. So stay tuned and watch the launch of WNTV.
opening of the Western Nigeria Television Service was a great occasion, not only because it was the first of its kind in the whole of Africa, but also because of the prodigious efforts which had gone into making it possible in so shortly three months. It was a proud moment for Mr. E. Coley and the other directors of Western Chief Anaharo opened the proceedings. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the government of Western Nigeria, I welcome all of you to the official opening of the television service in this region. Uh, today is a great day in the history of this region, and I think also in the history of the development of television and broadcasting services on this continent. And I'd like to thank you all very much for coming here this evening to join us in this official opening. Um, I call on His Excellency the Governor General, Sir James Robertson, to say the opening remarks. Your Excellency, Honorable Premier, Honorable Ministers, Chairman and Members of the Television Corporation, Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to me to be present here this evening at the inaugural ceremony of the Western Regions Television Service. And I very much appreciate the invitation which the Chairman and Board of Directors of the Western Region of Nigeria's Radio Vision Service have sent me. And I should like to congratulate both the Government of the Western Region and the Overseas Rediffusion Company on the enterprise and determination which they have shown in preparing for this ceremony and for the opening of the television service in such record time. Chiva Wallabo spoke next. Uh, your Excellencies, Your Highnesses, ladies and gentlemen, a uh, few events in my life have given me so much pleasure as to come before you tonight to open formally the first television network in Africa. <laughs> Western Nigeria television is already being emulated by other parts of this country as well as the number of other African states gain much from this great medium of mass information and instruction. It is a powerful influence for good. And I am confident that in due course, it will assist in making our great country even greater. Very soon, we'll introduce commercial radio to Nigeria. And we have made careful plans that this medium in formally launching Western Nigeria television first in Africa. I ask you all to rejoice with my colleagues and me on this memorable occasion. After the ceremonies in Western Hall, the guests went to television... Welcome back. Um, it's still Odua Legends on Arise Conversations, brought to you live and direct by Heritage Multimedia Television. Uh, we just finished watching a video clip of the launching of the WNTV WNBS, that's the first time station ever in the whole of Africa and number five in the world. And that was under, so giving us, um, especially the younger generation, because as you know, she's 72 years young. That's what I said. She's 72 years young. So she obviously has some experience. And as I said in my promo, she has earned her place as an elder stateswoman. 
uh, we had a little glitch in technology because of the rains at both ends, but uh, we're glad to bring her back. Thank you so much for us back, ma'am. And um, thank, you. I'm, I'm, thank you, ma'am. I'm, I'm wondering whether you did catch uh, the, the clip that we had played. And did. Um, how, did that, did. how did that make you feel? watching that wonderful memories wonderful wonderful memories okay. absolutely okay. <laughs> it's uh, so Good. sad when we now think you know how or where we're at now if way back in 1959 under your you know late papa Ulo's leadership as premier western region western nigeria were able to launch a tv number one in africa number five in the world within three months sure. where are we today you know and sure. on that note but I, I i still don't want us to lose the you know the beauty of how we felt you know watching that because we did that we did that okay. you know uh, the generations ahead of us did that and it's something to be very proud of and we're hoping that we will be able to re reverse and go back to those times and listen mm -hmm. again to the words of Chief Awulowo and what he was enjoining us as, um, you know, particularly Yoruba people because that was Western region. And talking about Yoruba and Western region, um, what are your views, ma'am, on the ongoing global movement and agitation for a Yoruba nation? Odudua nation. It's all over the place. But you are in a good and very uh, strategic position to not only share your own views, but also to point us in the direction moving forward. Over to you, Ma. Right. Thank you very much. Um, that is the trending issue. That is the most important issue right now um in in yoruba land um it was papa who said that the success and stability of this country can cannot um be left to wishful thinking um but it has to be rooted in scientific and uh, research-based thinking. And he went on to say that um, a unitary constitution cannot work in a situation where a federal system is what is needed. <clears throat> and he did his research of all nations of the world and seriously it was all nations of the world if you read his book you will see that he went through all the nations in the world one by one and his conclusion was that any country that is multilingual multicultural must by any means be governed uh, through a federal constitution and suitability is so important in the constitution that any country runs if the country runs a unitary system when it needs a federal system it causes problems it causes yeah friction it causes all sorts of problems and the minute Absolutely. you change to, uh, to to the correct kind of constitution all the frictions disappear there's friendliness and everything goes well in nigeria we are a multilingual multicultural multinational country and therefore it is absolutely imperative that we go back to the federal constitution we're not 
asking to go into uncharted waters. We're not asking right. to do something that has never been done before. We're actually asking to, book, to go back to an era that worked very well for everybody. It was an era where the regions had autonomy, substantial autonomy. They had their own constitution. They had their own um, facts. And they had, they had substantial control over their own resources. And uh, our generation as it was in the beginning. At that time, it was only ECN, the Electricity Corporation of Nigeria. A lot of young people won't recognize <laughs> that name, ECN. Never. <laughs> it, was only, it was only ECN that was authorized and licensed to generate power. But it wasn't yes. working for the regions. So they mm. collaborated. This is another very important point. They collaborated mm. and made sure that the constitution was amended such that every region would have the power to generate, would have the authority to generate power. That worked. Mm -hmm. And in the Western region, rather than start afresh, what they did was to give mm -hmm. a loan of, I think, 1.3 million pounds to ECN to do the mm -hmm. job for them, mm -hmm. interest-free for some years. And that worked very well. The other one, yes was the commodity marketing boards were all under the authority of the federal government. Then the Action Group and the NCNC collaborated and made sure that those commodity boards were returned to the regions where they belonged. And yes, and what happened was that immediately a sum of 34 million pounds, which was no mean amount of money, was made available to the West region. And between 1953 to 54, uh, the, the, the revenue in the, in the Western was in the region of about 5 million pounds or 6 million pounds. When this happened, the following year, they got in excess of 13 million pounds. Those were the sources from which free education and all the other things were able to do. So uh, 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 the, the resources that made it possible for the Western region to do all those things that they needed to do. So when you devolve power, you allow people to do what they need to do for themselves, and you give them control over their resources, then things go well. And at that time, each region, once each region introduced something that was of benefit to their people, the other regions followed suit. It just happened that so a lot was, of times... There was, like a health, there was like a healthy competition. Healthy competition. And okay. the, the beneficiaries of all of that were the ordinary the, folk. The people. The people, people for whom government is in place in the first place. The government is there to serve the people anyway. So, yes. so uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, we need to revamp the constitution and return to a federal constitution. And I think what is needed there is dialogue, collaboration. It's been done before. I've given you two examples now from the 50s. And mm. I believe that there are very, very important influential people in each zone that is invested in this idea. And if the majority is um, um, 
want this to happen, then it will happen. In the 2014 um, conference, the, the recommendations were more or less what I'm talking about, that uh -huh. you know, the federal constitution and with provisos for, for states that might struggle, that don't have resources. And by the way, there is no state in this country that doesn't have resources, absolutely none. There's a list that's been going around of all the minerals and all the resources that can be found in every single state in this country. And so wow. what we need is the will and the the only best interests of everybody because we started off with you know just complaining and by the way you know the yoruba people are very 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 particular about justice mm -hmm. it is what they live and breathe they can't stand injustice to anybody. In fact, uh, I'm full of all these stories. If you give me the time, there was a time I was the, going in Lagos. Today is dedicated, <laughs> we have the time. <laughs> I was driving on Lagos Island, one of those tiny roads in, in Lagos Island, Apose and all those areas. And I. And one of the would be from the southeast, and everybody came out and descended on this taxi and and made sure that he paid this this uh, trader something. To Thank you very much for you know taking us through that. But I was also asking the question because a lot of people on that are watching us now are asking, you know. Are you saying that we should just stay within this federal government of Nigeria, even though it doesn't seem to be working, rather than an um, urban or public, as it were? Yes. Well, I, I'm a realist. Um, that is the only option that I can see at the moment. Stay within and revamp the constitution because wanting to leave unilaterally sounds very much like secession to me and i am not sure that violence is going to solve this we've been down that road before i don't think we we will just get up today and say okay, the Yoruba nation is leaving Nigeria and everybody will say, okay, bye-bye, safe journey. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it's going to involve a lot of bloodshed. And are we ready for that? That is my question. Um, I, that's why I, I am a realist. I, I, don't, I don't believe in fighting a battle or a war that you are not sure what the outcome is going to be. It's possible that there are things that I don't know, but from where I'm sitting, um, declaring war on the Nigerian nation at this point, which is what it would be tantamount to, by declaring. I mean, it's 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 lovely. It, it's it's. Um, it sounds so liberating that you know okay the the, the Yoruba nation will stand on its own etc but what is the process by which that is going to happen that is not going to involve bloodshed and from, from my knowledge of Yoruba people we are a very cautious very calculating people and if the Yoruba stand up and declare such a thing, I would like to think that it is because they have mapped out the process and have seen victory ahead. 
So um, other than that, I, I, I don't think it is impossible. I mean, I was reading something yesterday by somebody, I forget his name. He's the chairman of a group called the Dialogue Group in Kaduna. He's from Kaduna and he was saying that um, Nigeria can't should, remain should break up. together. <laughs> exactly. And yes. you hear sound bites like that. Um, the Colonel uh, Umar wrote a letter the other day and cautioned mm -hmm. about uh, uh, lop lopsided appointments, etc. So sound bites are coming. If it is a, a situation where we all sit down around the table, all Nigerians, and say, actually, this marriage and, is and not agree. working. And agree to to part um, amicably, then that that's fine. Then that is what we all want. But I would not want to be part of anything that leads people into tragedy. Um, so that that's my that's my view. Thank you, Matt. May, may, thank you so much for, for sharing your views with us and your thoughts on that. Um, but from also hearing and what is trending, um, the people that are really agitating for the Ududua Republic are the younger generation, whether we like it or not, uh, they are the majority of the population. Um, and as far as, far as they're concerned, a lot of them, since they were born, they haven't seen anything that is um, worth their wanting to see within this entity called Nigeria. That's one. Two, we know that even the Igbos have also been agitating for their Biafra Republic for a long while. Now, most recently, we've also been hearing from the North the northerners who also want their Ariwa Republic. So, as you rightfully said, maybe there's some things that is going on um, behind closed doors or, you know, that we haven't really seen play yet. But the agitation is very real. And as you said, the Yorubas would not stand up to say they want to do something. They first win the battle in their mind, and then their very short war is them to do one. It happened. Yeah. Um, what I would want you to now shed a little bit of light. Would you say it's because there's a difference between the older and younger generation of Nigerians and politicians? Yes. And, you know, the older politicians were able to identify the problems of their day. There was freedom from poverty, freedom from ignorance, freedom from colonial rule, uh, all those freedoms. Now this generation, they also are at liberty, of course, they, they should identify what their own, what the challenges of their own generation are. And it is up to them to to determine to decide how they are going to tackle those problems. You know, yeah. um, if if the majority want a separation, of course I will go with it. If that is what they want, um, and if the if Nigerians, if the whole country has decided that. Yeah, this is this is what is best for us because let's let's face it, we started with complaining, we started murmuring, we graduated to complaints. Now it has become violent. And what yeah. what is the name? So it is better for leaders of thought, leaders of thought to actually address this situation, address the problem in a very serious way. Um, we need a strategic alliance. We need a strategic Absolutely. alliance 
or of of leaders of thought, um, traditional rulers, politicians, intellectuals, um, faith-based leaders, everybody, even even the even the the the, the moneyed classes. They all need to come together and decide what is in, in the best interest of all of us. And if we come to the conclusion, actually, it's best for everybody for us to part ways, of course. Of course. Would you, would you, would you not agree, Ma, that um, for a way forward, would it not be, first of all, more just? and um, fair if we say we are in a democratic uh, run type of government just as we go to the polls to elect who we want as our leaders could this not be put to the polls because at the end of the day it's the people that are really agitating majority of them the younger generation can we not go to the polls and vote do you want to stay Yes. Do you want to leave? Uh, yes, we. That would be the best thing. That's what is called a referendum. However, my th that's the best way. It is actually the the best way. But before we do that, we have to. The electoral process has been so heavily compromised mm. in Nigeria. Uh -huh. So we need to to make sure that that the message you see in the past we keep talking about the past. It's not that we want to go back to the past. It is just that it worked so well for them. There was such synergy between yes. the leaders and the led and the people. And yes, it, and people, and it it was it, it was a. a a partnership of equals. The, the led did not feel that they were subordinate, and the leaders did not treat them as subordinates either. They was, it was a partnership. Absolutely. It was a partnership, and it was a contract between them. Okay, you go and lead. You do certain things for us. Absolutely, because when and when they we did when their we pledge, Yes, ma. I was saying that when you're very correct, ma, because when we think back um, to those days when, you know, your father was in politics, I remember vividly, you know, as a child, people would go in, come into your home, come into our home. They didn't need to homes. There was nobody policing them. They went carrying guns. You know, they to obviously take their turn and, you know, and wait for their turn to be seen. But just like right these days, the, 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 the leaders are so far away from the lead. Hence the discord, hence the agitation, hence the lack of trust. And for the younger generation, um, they are probably not as patient as my generation or your generation they're not that patient because they have a, a global network you mm -hmm. know they they are in touch with their peers from across the mm -hmm. world through things the more able to talk about issues concerned in their places and i think i think i for a fact that when they have these conversations Conversations and they find out what is going on at your end is as bad as what's going on at our end. Forget the fact that we're the Western world and we're supposed to be more civilized. It seems the younger generation, uh, those generations that have kind of been boxed into a corner and they are so angry. I remember there was um, a, a bunch of students that I deliver a, 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 a training for. And I was asking them, oh, who are your, who would you call your your heroes or the people that you would um, say um, you want to emulate? I was very shocked, man. These were 
students from age 13 to 17. So they were secondary students. This was in Nigeria. And I was very, very, first of all, I was shocked, but I was also very heartbroken from what they said. They said, oh, none of you adults. I said, what? They said, none of you adults in Nigeria. That all the adults that spent anything have all gone. They're all dead. So all these adults now that are rulers, that are, you know, governors or in or, or presidents, etc., that they don't do anything for us. They don't even know we exist. That was what I took with me. They said they were convinced that these leaders don't know that we, the younger generation, exist. Now, there's something else that they said. That is when I became very heartbroken. And they said, ma'am, we want you adults, you grown-ups, to remember that one day we will be in the positions that you are and we will show you. That totally freaked me out. These are, these are teenagers between age 13 and 17. So how, what is it that we have done to make our youths have that kind of mindset? And these are the ones that are even in school. How about the millions that are not in you know, education? And that's why I was saying that the, the younger generation, so maybe there's um, something that you would like to, to say to the young, because a whole lot of, we have hundreds of people watching now, quite a number of them, younger generation. Is there something you'd like to say to them? Because what they have said is real and it's true. None is a lie. I will. Uh... There's a lot of blame game going on um, at, at the moment. Um, how do I put this without sounding? Hmm. I also have talked to quite a number of young people, a little older than the than the demography that, than the teenagers people in university and I, I was speaking to some dear children of mine they, they, they are students at one of the premier universities in Nigeria and they were very very honest with me and I said what is your vision for the future of Nigeria and how do you want to actualize it and they said to me they said mommy most of our peers just want to make money. So that's another section of, of the young people. But where, do, where would you say they got that from? They got it from the society. Now, they got it from society. That is what they have seen. That is what they have grown up to see. If they feel angry towards the older generation, your generation, my generation, generation younger than us, you know, those in the fifth, their 50s and 60s, or maybe a little older than us too. The reason why they feel angry is because they hear snippets. They, 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 they don't know enough about the history of Nigeria, that is for sure. But they hear snippets of the benefits that our generation enjoyed and they feel that we kind of are like the dead sea that took and took and took and took and have given nothing back so they they have a right to feel angry in that sense but i do say that what they need to do is not enough to be angry because I'm sure young people in the colonial days were also very angry. But a few yes. of them sat there, defined their problems, strategized. They defined their problems, designed solutions, and strategized as to how to bring those to That is what they need to do. 
it's a lot of work. It, it's not it's not going to be easy. It's not going to come on a platter of gold. They're going to have to work hard. And it's not going to involve everybody because even as we speak, if there's an election tomorrow in Nigeria, yes, ma'am, there's a horde of young people that have been so dis they have no power, they have been so disempowered, right. they have no they, they have no very little knowledge. They are unable little education because education is not just the three hours. Education is to help you to think widely, deeply, out of the box, mm. and to think intelligently. These people are yeah. unable to do that. If there's an election tomorrow, you will see them line up to, to take 2,000 Naira and vote. There are so Very many sad. of them yeah. like that. Only a few that are educated and are able to think, into, there are a few of them. But what I say is that you don't need a multitude. You need mm. a critical mass yes. of people Absolutely. who can think deeply. I, I, I read once in a while some young people that have been thinking, and there are one or two come to my consciousness. I don't know them. I wish I did. Once this is over, I try and make contact with them. They need to find one another mm. and think through their problems because it's their world going forward. They need to Absolutely. find one another, think through their problems, strategize as to how to get out of their problems. That is what they need to do. And they need to be selfless about it. Too many times with our generation and with this immediately after, it's either money or position. They're, they're already angling something. There's an angle to their activism. And that is not There's working. an agenda. That is, there's an agenda. That's why agenda. we don't have enough of selfless people like they were in those days. You know, the rich just gave them money to carry on. They were not contractors. They did not look for contracts. They just were all invested in this vision that this, this place must progress and we must move forward. And they all gave everything that they had. Those that had talents, Am I with you? I'm listening very attentively. Yes. Those that, that have talents, those that are politicians, those... Chief Awolowo was not the most prominent of them all, but they, they looked around and saw something in him and chose him and said, you are the one that is going to lead this. He was a provincial person. He wasn't a Lagos elite. But they were also invested in moving on, that they were willing to be to sacrifice and to, right. to, yes, be, to be selfless and to be selfless. And this is what they have to do. This is what yes, they sir. absolutely yes, have to do. And they will have to work hard and think hard. And it's not a tea party, it's not going to be um, at all. <laughs> hard. So it's because there is a lot, a lot of obstacles on the way. And they have to be courageous. They have to be, they have to have tons and tons of courage in order to do any of this. So that is really what I, I would like to say to them. And as I've said it so many times, they don't have to be many. Jesus mm. had only 12 disciples. He ended up with 11. They're still shaking the world today. And mm. Don't write anybody off. It may Absolutely. Be the person who you think is useless, that is against this thing, might get their own epiphany and end mm. up doing more than everybody else. So they have to be open minded, they have to Absolutely. be laser, laser focused 
on their go. Laser focus. And that is what they must always look at. Mm. All Absolutely. the time. We refuse to be distracted. I say all and 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 I also saw, probably not get not get too emotive or emotional. No, you know, no. because they sometimes have, that that um, makes us lose focus, as you've said. They lose focus. They lose focus. They must be so focused, so focused, and so determined to 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 get to their goal. And these are young people who are better exposed, better educated than we ever were or the old ones ever were. And so they have the tools, they have the networks to do what they want to do. And I, you know, once there's, they have the will and the determination, I'm sure they'll get there. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, but thank you very much, and I'm sure uh, our younger generation viewers that are watching have been able to take um, a few nuggets uh, on board from what you had to share with them just now, because that is so key. And um, if I can recap what you said briefly, um, you said first of all to be able to identify what the challenges are. They also have to be very strategic in how they plan to find solutions. And once that is done, they need to be laser focused to going forward and moving forward to what we will call the promised land that they envisage in their minds. And thank you so much, Matt. Um, still talking about um, Nigeria and June 12th. Um, my next question is um, about today, really, and um, it, to other people around the world, it's just another day, the 12th of June. But to us in Nigeria, June 12 um, holds something significant. So my question is, is the June 12 ideology still relevant in the Nigeria of today? And if so, what are the pros and cons of this, apart from the fact that one of the governments, I can't remember which particular one, declared this day as Democracy Day. What exactly have we, have we been able to achieve from pushing this ideology of June 12th? Over to you, ma'am. Well, the most important achievement is that we, we're now democratically governed. We've had democracy since 1999. That I, I think is the, the greatest uh, uh, benefit from this. Uh, democracy remains the best form with all the freedoms that it produces. Um, it can be misused, it mm. can be. Charlie does in, 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 in Nigeria, but um, I we keep going. We, we keep working on it. Um, but the, the greatest, the greatest uh, problem is leadership recruitment to drive this democracy forward. Because uh -huh. uh, democracy now, unfortunately, has been so heavily monetized. That uh -huh. is a pity. I don't think the people who fought this has been Upcoming. heavily, heavily, yeah, it's been heavily monetized. And there is that it's almost like um, uh, a, a, a hard headed. Um, investment program, you know? You, you invest money to contest for elections or to, to support a particular candidate and you expect returns. 
yeah. the yeah. who invest in the candidates expect returns the candidate himself expects returns and and because the electorate the electorate has been paid to to vote them in um they they feel no compunction whatsoever ignoring them for the time they're in office so um i don't know how that can be changed but these are you know fine ways by which democracy can be fine-tuned we continue to to fine-tune it and until we get it to so we get to to the promised land <laughs> where, where where it become uh, it approximates the ideal that we want um i don't think that a lot of the time we we um we select or elect the the, the best candidates that we can that are available to us um but it because it is all about money i'm afraid um this is what we get but you know we as i said we, we keep going the 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 the, the ethos of june 12 yes is still alive we still want democracy we want to be free to elect our leaders even if all we do is to, is to sell our votes for now a time will come when we will learn that it's, it's, it's not the best way to go and then we'll change again and and do it better so yeah it is it's those are the pros and cons as i can see thank you so the much pro is that democracy is good the con is that it's become monetized <laughs> but we can work on it mm. but it, it can mm -hmm. still be salvaged yes it, it can, be can still be salvaged um yes there's also a question that um, one of our viewers has asked, and I, I believe it's another person from the younger generation. And I'm just going to read, it says, it's also it's similar to one of the questions I, I was thinking of asking, that, you know, after so many years that we have um, been able to get from under the colonial masters, as a nation, we don't seem to be moving forward at all especially now that we just played back that clip of the wntv way back in 1959 that person is saying wow that was before they were born they didn't even know that nigeria did such amazing things back then so how come in 2020 you know we can't even when we're looking at which countries have a um, television as a technology, we can't, Nigeria can't even, we're not even talking about the independently owned TV channels or radio, channels. we're talking about the government owned ones, federal and state. And they're asking, it's just, it seems as if, just like I was also saying yesterday, we're taking one step forward and 20 steps backwards. Um, as comical as it sounds, it, it is the truth. Um, how, what is it that can be done for us to have sustainability even if you cannot maybe improve on something don't regress why are we regressing what seems to be the challenge there the challenge is leadership the challenge uh, is leadership uh, selfless leadership um if we have leaders that are determined to take this country forward and to keep taking it forward, then it wouldn't be this difficult. That clip you showed is part of a whole CD, which yes. in fact, yes. yes, in fact- I just took a bit of it out I'll there. Tell you, I'll tell you the story behind that CD. It was a video, VHS video that I had. 
and it was practically the last item I threw into my box when I was going to Holland. Okay. And so when I got there and I I left Holland, I decided that I just wanted to go back to medicine, went to the UK. I had it changed to a, a DVD. DVD. And the gentleman, the young man that did it for me, the day I went to collect it, uh, by the way, when I now brought it back for the 50th anniversary of television in, Ni in Nigeria, uh, which coincided with Papa's centenary, some state functionaries, so, some functionaries of states that were there asked me for it, and I was flabbergasted that these things disappeared from the archives. That was the only one that survived, and I'm glad we put it out there on our website and it's now gone viral. I'm viral. so glad. The young man asked, the day I went to collect it, the young man asked me, he said, well, your country seems to have achieved so much in the past. Why are you still in, and I had no answer. I said, well, <laughs> I, I can't answer that. Now, in 1961, South Korea had a GDP per capita of $72. Nigeria had a per capita of $103. By 2000, and, uh, South Korea was $30,000. Nigeria was $200. Then South Korea was $30,000. What happened? Between 1961 and 1997, South Korea put in place a formidable program of human development. They, they just went for it. Education, health, it was like a military campaign. They went yes. for it and, de and just developed everybody and it was it was multidisciplinary, multisectoral. It involved the universities. It involved the industries. The industries worked together with the universities to to tell them what skills they needed in industry. Absolutely. So that Absolutely. they just didn't turn out people with philosophy um, with degrees and, and, and so 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 it was it was. It was so, they were so committed to it. And that was, was because of the leader that they had at the time. Had the, same the, time. Thing, the same thing in Singapore, the same thing. Malaysia came here to take palm seedlings. Ah, I can never forget that. So, so you know, but to, to, today, they are also up there. In 1955, the Western region was spending 20, about 28 percent of their budget on education. Uh, in 2016, uh, Nigeria, the, the Nigeria was spending six percent on health. The Western region was spending 10 percent. By 2010. Uh, 2016, Nigeria was spending 4%. So you can see, it's a question of priorities. We got our priorities wrong. Wrong. And um, we we just kind of missed the boat. But I mean, we no, no country misses the boat permanently. You can always re regroup. Hope, hope is not lost. No, it's never lost. So you can always refocus. It's a question. There's no country that has enough for all its needs. It's always a question of priority, and that is that is what it is. Um, so that, that that's so. It's the short answer to your question is it's a question Thank of you. leadership and prioritization. And maybe I, if you don't mind me adding, and also followership, because sometimes oh, 
the followership, <laughs> Some like followers the, the, you know. We've, yeah, we've talked about it. The followership are just, they are just gone to sleep. They don't ask questions. There is like, a, you know, supplicatory docility, groveling psychophancy that Which just doesn't terrible. work. Yeah. Uh, and so, but the, 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 what, what amazes me is that in those days, the followership, the electorate were not as, as educated in book terms as they are now. But they were all, they, knew exactly, they were very clued they up, exactly very, very clued up. They, they knew exactly what they wanted and they were nobody's fool. They did not feel inferior or subservient to anyone. But, you know, would you I would you then say how... ma would you then say ma because what you just um said now strikes a chord a very strong chord um to me as a as a yoruba person doesn't that show us that before the advent of uh, the western world we as a people had our way how we ruled how we led our people, how the led also um, participated in governance and how back in the day it was obviously monarchs, how the monarchs would not go ahead and just do things willy nilly without carrying the seven main chiefs that were in the council with the Oba and the people. You know, you, they wouldn't do anything without carrying the people along. And there was no Western education, as you rightfully mentioned, ma'am, at the time. But these were highly intelligent people, some of them millionaires in their own rights back then, from their farming or trading or whatever it is that we're doing. But we had order. We had order. Um, we understood how things were to be done and how things should be run. Is it that the Yoruba have um, thrown this away, as in the baby, the bathwater, and the tub, all away? Well, I, I have to agree with you. We've lost our way. We've we we really lost our way because um, there's a book by uh, uh, a lady called Insanorte. It's about the um, uh, the 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 social and political setup in Yoruba land, with emphasis on Remo, uh, uh, and it, it's a very interesting book that shows actually that democracy has been at work in our traditional setting long before the. Colonial Colonizers. came, yes, came came in, and even when the during the I suppose the first republic in the fifties in elections, there there was a case of an Oba in Remo here that called his people to a town hall meeting the day before an election and said, election. "No, you vote." You must vote for a particular party. That is what I want, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, nobody argued. And uh, when he came and the results were counted, the party that he didn't want won ninety nine percent of them. <laughs> the the people had spoken. Of course, and the following day he declared for that party. The other declared for that party. <laughs> that, that, that's so the might of that, that the people. Was, oh my goodness, the, the, that was Yoruba people. And, and you remember, they had their inner caucus, they had their cabinet, the Oshubo. Yeah. Yes. Without yeah. whom the Oba couldn't just do anything. And yes. the people, the people that were in, elected into the Oshubo, they were never elected because they had money. They were no. always people 
one who had high integrity. integrity. And two, <laughs> most importantly, people who the people knew that if there was a problem in town and this person had his own problem, he would put his own problem aside and solve the problem of the town first. Problem of the people. Before yes. The yes. So, so also, those, also those rely reliability. Re reliability and selflessness. Those were the and, and if anyone tried to 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 buy their way through the they laughed at and, and and you know so it was never part of our culture how we lost that is beyond me i i think we lost that recently because when i was in politics i still had people who came to meetings in my you know in my group as they were called yes. at that time came to meetings and every time they would raise their hand and say we are not comfortable coming to this kind of meeting because we come here we sit on chairs we don't know who rents who pays for these chairs we drink coke we don't know who, <laughs> who pays for this they, coca cola they, they, they. <laughs> we we are used to going to to belonging to parties where we pay our dues. They, 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 they wanted a stake. They wanted a stake. We have a say, and we can say what we want. And, and and I always used to say, well, this is just a political association. That was in in the days before before the parties were formed. The, the ban was lifted. <laughs> yes. So those were my explanations. But then, you know, um, it then graduated from that and people were actually paid to come to those meetings and paid to, to, to do vote. everything. Yeah. And so um, I, I don't know how we can get out Find of it, our but way. these young people these these young people can they can because they are in the majority they can actually invade all these political parties and go in their large numbers and make their numbers count count because politics as they, they say is is it the a game, it's of a numbers. game of numbers it's a game of numbers and so they can they can make their numbers count and if you know, if if they are not welcome in some political parties, they can set up their own. Chief Paolo will oh, set up oh, his own. Um, Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, <clears throat> now, um, even though we know this is about Nigeria, but we also know that Nigeria cannot be in isolation, just um, as uh, we as individuals cannot be in isolation. Um, there's another thing that's been trending across the world especially uh, it, it, obviously it um, started from the united states when uh, uh mr george floyd was um sadly murdered in broad daylight um even with that going on we also were reading other things that were trending from nigeria of people who were also being murdered young girls that were being raped and killed um for us as a what would you what would you say should be done because it's um especially it's all in the midst of covid-19 so we, the the world has covid-19 to deal with we are all <laughs> dealing with that and you would know more about that being a, a medical doctor and then we have these other things that are also threatening to one's life so um young people can no longer go out again um this particular young girl went to a church to study that gives one palpitations just to even think about it that was one issue and a, 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 and a case that we heard about how about the hundreds that we don't even get to know about we just know that that person is missing or they find their body somewhere where would you say the world generally 
because it's not only America, it's not only about Britain or Nigeria. There are instances across the world. Where have we gone wrong as human beings? Why do we have this onslaught in the world, but most importantly, in our own home base, Nigeria? There's this casualness about taking life about taking human life there's a there's a kind of casual attitude towards taking life i i am i must be honest with you i don't know where this came from i i do know that part of it is that in nigeria i'm talking about nigeria um this inordinate inordinate lust for wealth there's a lot of um um what they call um you, you know people just take lives in order to make money and a lot of that goes on there's a lot of crime goes on a lot of kidnapping a lot of uh, in fact it, it's it's terrible i just don't even want, want to talk about it and um and people have come to think that it's okay to do uh, those things uh, because society worships money and doesn't ask where the money comes from as a matter of fact um the most shameful thing that can happen to you as I see it in Nigeria today is to not have money. Hmm. Maybe be rich before and not have enough to dispense. Again, that is hmm. what people it's like, find it's like most a crime. Shameful. It's a crime. <laughs> it's, 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 that's what people find most shameful. And you know, people just spend money and they worship people who have this money and and that is the god with a small g that people worship it is most unfortunate and i just think that the best way is is enlightenment and and generally uh, retraining the minds of young people to realize that actually the most important things in this life are those things that cannot be bought with money. Oh. Things like love for fellow human beings, and the love of your house, the love of your parents, the love of friends, um, and so many other things that cannot be bought with money and, oh. and they need to be taught that and they need to be shown examples of where money actually would be nothing. I have another story. When uh, uh, I, I have to apologize that I refer to Papa a lot, but you know, he's my because role model. That's your dad. And also your the first the first mentor you ever had. Yes. Any any when, young girl would look up to their dad. Yes. Many years ago, when he wanted to go to he used to go to Jerusalem on pilgrimage once in a while. And every time he went, he used to go with an entourage. He used to take people from church, you know, who he wanted to encourage in the Christian faith, just to just to can be a kind of reward. So there were in excess of 20 of them that were going with him. And in those days, um, you had to apply for foreign exchange and it was sold to you in the form of traveler's checks. You remember traveler's checks? Yes, ma'am. You had to go to the bank to go and sign 
you take your passports along, you sign passport, traveler's check. Your checkbook. passport has to be stamped. <laughs> and uh, all the documents and everything had to be properly done. But because Papa was who he was, the bank made an exception and said, okay, gather everybody in your house, in a Papa, and um, we, will, we will bring uh, one of our staff or two of them will come they will process all the papers, process. all the passports, everything, and they will just bring everything back. And everybody would sign their traveler's checks in the presence of the bank staff. On the way from the bank, the bag that contained all the passports and all the documentation and all the unsigned traveler's checks, because un unsigned traveler's checks are as good as cash. You know, anybody yes. that gets it can sign it. Can sign it and double yeah. and uh, uh, that bag was snatched, it was stolen. Oh dear, and this was like a couple of days before they were due to travel. So you had the problem of not not only mm -hmm. getting the money, but how do you get the passports and the visas back? Passports. So when they got to the house and there was commotion, what to do? Within about 15, 20 minutes, somebody then looked at the, you know, outside the um, the security lodge and saw a bag and it was this bag. And they picked up that bag and lo and behold, everything was It was the, the stolen not a, single, not a single passport was lost, not a single sheet <laughs> of travelers was lost. Now, wow. that 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 no that, how can you buy that kind of that kind of i suppose love respect from the Goodwill. people who stole it yes yeah I, I suppose they saw his name they must have and, opened and, the bag yeah, and seen absolutely and saw his, seen his the name you know that we can't do this to this person so mm. it, it, you know, it's it's people need to be taught. Young people need to be taught. And money is not everything. Huh. Um, and, and I think that they have become um, ruthless. Um, not only because they're looking for money, but also because they just feel like orphans. That the society does hasn't given them anything they 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 kind of they're hardened um and and they talk to one another they are cults in schools even in primary schools they are cults and oh so dear. and and parents are not there a, a lot of the time to mentor their children parents are out looking for their daily bread etc and, and it's it's all gone bad but yes, a lot can uh -huh. be done a lot can be done by schools a lot can be done by faith-based organizations to reorientate Orientate. these yes these children because there's there's a, a lot of they're they're kind of ruthless and and, and yeah uh, and and um, it's it, it's 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 a problem it's a very it's a very disheartening state of affairs it is very disheartening that, that we, state that of affairs. Face. it's quite different from racism it, what is happening in nigeria is, is different from from racism is a, a quite different um and in a way the the death it has kind of thrown it up again, brought it into bold relief, and people are discussing it more and thinking about it more and reconsidering. And I, I actually think that the case of Amy Cooper is mm. is, is is very um, important because. I'm certain that she shocked herself. 
by what she did. Mm. If she was told a day before or even minutes before that, that she would do that, I'm sure she would argue. Because I gather she's liberal. She's, um, you know, she, she would consider herself non-racist. And the reason mm -hmm. why I mentioned is that I, I suspect that the vast majority of people who believe that they are non-racist are probably oh. in the same uh, and and you know maybe they are maybe they're not but there must be a number that would when when push comes to shove would uh, a knee jerk uh, reflex would behave huh. how Amy Cooper did and that I again did. has been put into bold relief. And people will now reconsider. And I'm, I'm really um, gratified that a lot of the anger and outrage has been expressed in Europe and America. I'm a bit uh, disheartened that not enough has been done uh, in Africa. But, Africa. You know, Maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe there's a reason for that. But I, I think a lot of reflection is going to go on in private hearts, in group discussions, and I'm, I'm hoping that um, you know it, it will change things for the better. Thank you so much, ma'am. You know, we're, we're talking about um, um, what has happened thus far and the kind of crimes that are also committed against um, young people, particularly young girls, females. Um, from your perspective, because you've um, worked both in the public and private sectors, You've also had the opportunity to go abroad to work as in your capacity, not only as a professional, but as a woman. Um, would you say women in Nigeria have been accorded the same acknowledgement and similar respect as their male counterparts? No, they haven't. This is... Uh a totally male dominated society and no no apologies about it um in 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 business only 20 percent of businesses in the formal sector are headed by women mm -hmm. only about 11 percent of board directors are women nigeria has the lowest uh, percentage of female representation in uh, in parliament in in Af in sub-Saharan Africa, certainly in the, the West African sub-region, and we rank 133rd um, in the world. In the world, in terms of female representation in in parliament, uh, so and. 60% of the out of school children before COVID, of course, about 13 million children as of maybe a year or two ago, out of school children wow. in Nigeria, 60% wow. of them are girls. So okay. what more can I say? Uh, we're just not there. And those who try to make an impact are maligned a lot of the time. Mm. They are given names. And so to are, stay in their places, know their places. <laughs> and, and they are accused of all sorts of things. Um, so no, women are not given the and I'll, and I'll tell you why I asked that question, ma'am. And that's why I first said you have actually been, um, you've worked in both the public and the private sector, and you've also had the opportunity to um, serve Nigeria abroad, so in another climate. 
and um, it's very very sad that that's the there was something else you said earlier when we were talking about the Yoruba nation and how the Yorubas conducted their affairs um, in ancient times, in olden times. Then you, you mentioned the Ushubu. There was still there was still a space that was kept for the female chief who was a member of the parliament. Because mm -hmm. it was believed, the Yoruba believe that it's the female that helps them to test the pulse of the people. It's the mm -hmm. woman that will come back to tell the KBC and his cabinet, this is what mm -hmm. the people are saying. This is how mm -hmm. they feel. And now maybe mm -hmm. you'll understand why a, a lot of the Yorubas feel very uncomfortable in this men place or space because our values our ethics um our etiquette the traditions we have our culture uh, our mindset is governed by what we have inherited from our ancestors and how things were done properly sadly there's no record of um founding fathers or founding mothers who sat to mutually agree the coming together of all the three regions on Nigeria. This was foisted on us by the colonial masters. And probably that is why we have these kind of challenges. And it also shows in the totality of it when we see very minimal number of women being allowed or be given the opportunity to serve. We tend to forget that this same female or girl child is what our mothers were, what we were before to become women and mothers. Mothers are the ones that run the home. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how intelligent or big the man of the house is, He's the head, he'll be accorded mm -hmm. respect. But the woman was the one that kept everything in order. The mm -hmm. woman is the one that gives birth to children, male and female. And it seems mm -hmm. a very easy thing or simple thing to get into our minds. I'm not sure at what point we chuck that away, especially the, and my apologies to any you know men that are watching but that seems to be the order of the day when i'm called to speak i always say to know the character of a boy child until he becomes a man show me the female in his life who was his grandma some even have grandmoms his mother his sisters that he grew up with, his aunties, his female cousin, his siblings that were female, that means his sisters. Then the wife he eventually marries, or you know, the wives, depending on if the person is polygamous. Um, who's, his, who's his daughter? Who's his um, female colleagues? Who's his girlfriend? his mistress, his side chick, because all these females, as um, comical as, a, as in my sound when I mentioned girlfriends and, you know, side chicks and mistresses, all females exist in the life of a male from the time he was born till he becomes a man. So, two things i want to bring out here Ma, and i would love your views on them one we can see that there can never be a man any man without a woman from the giving birth mm -hmm. to the nurturing to the raising to the training to the getting mm -hmm. ready to go into the world it boils down to mm -hmm. the female to the man or whoever mm -hmm. that female is that helped nurture that child on the flip side, what are we then doing as 
the girl child who becomes the woman and the mother and all these other females that I mentioned, we tend to forget that we have a key role in the life of any boy child until he becomes a woman. What are we doing? Are we raising monsters? Um, I agree we with also you. Have, we also have daughters. We ourselves become wives. We have sisters mm -hmm. who will marry mm -hmm. or date. Do we take all mm -hmm. that into consideration when we're raising our boys and our sons to becoming men who will ultimately become leaders of corporations or even countries, presidents, governors, senators, etc.? What is your mindset on those two aspects, ma'am? I was going to go back to that uh, point, what you, 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 you articulated it very, very well. A lot depends on mothers. There are, well, may, maybe they no longer behave like that. There, there used to be mothers who would uh, serve their children food, get their daughters to assist in the kitchen, to serve the food, get their daughters to clear up and wash up and not job. The boys job. That is wrong. The boys included, they must share it equally. Thank that you, way they begin to develop you, they begin to develop a respect for girls for the female child or for the female in their lives as they grow up because sometimes these boys are younger than the daughters that are made to wait on them hand and foot that is so wrong every child should be taught to do that and then from a very, very young age, every boy must be taught to respect huh. girls, huh. to respect them, to respect them as equals, as important members of the human race, race. and to, yes. to regard them as, as equals, as I said, so that they don't yes. see them as chattels yes. or as yes. people to be beaten black and blue when they or to yes. be treated badly because i don't know i i didn't grow up in a polygamous home but i don't believe even the people the, the, the men who were polygamous in those days i don't think they made it a point of duty to ill treat their wives in those days I think they, they had a measure of respect for their wives and they treated them well. And so from a very tender age, every boy must be told that you must respect, you must respect her body, you must respect her decisions, you must respect her no, and you must respect her yes. You have no right to violate the space of any other human being, male or female. They have to be taught that, and that depends on mothers and fathers. Absolutely. They have to be taught that. They have to be taught that. And uh, women also should be taught to protect themselves, to say no, uh -huh. to speak out when anything threatens their space. They must be, yes, they must be taught. They, and, and I love this idea of, of um, passwords. They must be taught how to say no to strangers, yes. no matter what. And you know, to, to to take care of themselves and 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 all of this. It, there's a lot of material 
online now. There are songs yes. to yes. teach little children about their bodies, that no body is allowed to touch certain you know, parts, parts of their bodies, no body is allowed to invade their space, and how they must speak out. There's a lot of resource online for even young people. And as they grow up, you know, age appropriate um, uh, trainings for, for oh, children. Yes. yes, there's a lot of information. And I, I think that is that is a good thing. But parents have the primary role to oh. play. Absolutely. And of course, schools. And parents have to be more involved in, mm. in the school as well. They have to be more involved in what goes on with school, even at the risk of becoming a nuisance. It's better to be called a it's nuisance than yeah. to be sorry. Than to be sorry. Thank you. Uh, so, so that's my view on that. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. I'm hoping that um, all females out there have listened to um, our special guest as she's been taking us down, you know, memory lane and also present times. Um, we're going to be wrapping up very soon. I have only about two or so uh, questions for our special guest. Um, if you're tuning in, you can still watch this again because we put it on Watch Party, we put it on YouTube and um, Facebook and Instagram, and we continue sharing it. Uh, this is Odua Legend, where we put the spotlight on those that we call legends um, of Odua, that is the, the descendants of Odua and the Yoruba nation. And our special guest today is none other than Ambassador Dr. Ola Tokumbo Aolo Odusubu, um, the last baby and last daughter of um, Papa Aolo, that's Chief Obafemi Aolo, who was Nigeria's, Western Nigeria's first premier and an astute uh, political leader during his time. And of course, her dear mother, Chief Mrs. Awulowo, that we all uh, refer to as HID, both of them of blessed memory. Now, sis, um, I've got two more questions, as I said. From your um, growing up with your parents, um, and up, even up to now, because you still carry memories. I mean, the, the clip we showed earlier when you came on i saw the the sparkle in your eyes because you it must have taken you down to that glorious day uh, back then and our prayers that nigeria will be able to embrace that glory again but more specifically towards yourself now what would you say are the things that you've learned from your beloved parents at both Chief Abafe Milo Aulo and Chief Mrs. HIV Aulo. So first, let's start with um, um, Mama, because they say first. What would you say is one thing? Obviously, you've learned so many things from your parents. They were your first mentors. They were your first role models. But what is one thing that you got from Mama HID that you carry with you every day? Gentle, quiet strength. She was a formidable lady, but she was very gentle, very quiet, said very mm. little if she didn't have to speak. But she knew exactly where she was going. She knew exactly what she wanted to do. And she, she was no pushover. So I take that from her. She was a very strong woman, very strong. But she, 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 she kept it to herself. Even in the home, you know, she, she ruled the roost. Um, mm -hmm. But she didn't say much. Whenever there was argument, she kept quiet. Uh, but she would bring the matter back when when the time was right and she often got her way she she was she was uh, yeah that's the one thing i have learned from her i have to confess that i learned that even more since she passed on 
passed. Oh wow! Well, it was still, she passed. It was after she passed that you know hindsight is always a very fine thing. And then I realized that Mama was something else. She mm. was. She was an incredible lady, and um, she was a fantastic help meet for her husband. For her husband. Mm. She she fell in with everything that he wanted to do. She was supportive of everything that he wanted to do. She never, ever, ever uh, withdrew her support for any reason. For example, uh, after the crisis of 1962 to 1966, hmm. any average woman would refuse the mention of politics in her home politics ever again. again. <laughs> <laughs> ever again. But as soon as Papa came back, and he even before the the ban was lifted he became active mama was right there front and center Beside him. and mm -hmm. oh my goodness she was she was there it was always it was never why should we do this it was always what do you want me to do so you know she was she was a fabulous fabulous woman so so to put it, the short answer is quiet gentle strength that is what i learned from her to the sage himself your beloved papa what papa? is that one thing that you carry with you till today i'll ask you to let me take that to two okay is two. the first one so the first one is um, an unambiguous mm. clarity, clarity about his mission in life and his vision. He was very, very clear in his mind about what he was here in this world to do. And the second thing is his amazing courage to follow his vision and to, to to push his mission forward he had incredible courage he had what a pastor described to me one day as reckless faith in god and that is the kind of faith that says what i'm doing is God's will for my life, and therefore He will look after me. I will not perish with it. And that was what He was. That was who He was. Wow. Wonderful. He did. Wonderful. Mm. <laughs> would you say, would you say though, the shoes? Well, I shouldn't even say that because I do know that the shoes are quite large. But in in a, in a way, somewhat, you've been able to step in those large shoes. Just like our own children will wear our shoes when they're young and still manage to walk in it. No, doing, okay. your, doing, your, doing your bit your way. Right. Maybe I would say I, I, I protected those shoes and kept them safe. Walking in those shoes is, 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 is too much. <laughs> <laughs> I just put a protective cover on those shoes and, and kind of and and, uh, and you take uh, a look uh, at uh, you take uh, a look uh, at them uh, you take uh, a look uh, at them uh, from uh, time to time exactly and <laughs> offer them to whoever feels that, that they want they are to, able they are able to carry on in it Papa there's only one of each one of us and oh, so that's he, that's was mm -hmm. he was unique he was unique. He did what he was sent here to do, and that's it. I will just hope Thank that you. there is something. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> now, two more questions. Um, you, now, coming to you personally, 
from your journey, um, earning your stripes as um, an elder stateswoman, um, and that's coming from me to you, because <laughs> seventy-two is not beans and doo doo. <laughs> you have, you know, done your bit both both uh, professionally in the medical field, um, as a diplomat when you served, um, as a politician, and also still doing what you're doing um, as a director of the Our Law Foundation, not forgetting your role as a wife, as a mother, as a grandmother. So you have earned your badge as an elder stateswoman. And looking back, what would you say is your philosophy towards life? Just like mom and dad, would you say one word or two? Um, I, I, I believe in a, in a simple life. Um, I believe in doing what is right. I believe in not following the multitude just because it is fashionable. And I believe in integrity. I believe in service to others. And I do believe very strongly that the most important things in this life are those things that money cannot that even touch. Money. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I believe in a, in a simple life. Um, and that, that, that's me. I, uh, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And to wrap up, what is your, your um, message to those watching us, be they of um, the Yoruba nation, uh, the Nigerian nation itself? and even the global community of Pan-Africans, because as we know, um, a very high percentage of those that were carted away from West Africa were mostly of the Yoruba race. What would be your message and your last word to them and our viewers? Uh, today, Africa is often seen as the basket case of the world. And I believe that that description shouldn't belong to us, that we have the capacity, the resources, material and human, to make a difference to our continent and to cause the world to sit up and take notice and respect us. But we have to do it ourselves. We absolutely, <clears throat> we absolutely have to remember who we are, where we are coming from, and what we are capable of. And we have to allow <clears throat> the best hands to take charge of this content so that we can be a continent to be reckoned with in the world. I know we can do it. I know we know where things have gone wrong. I know that we know what is wrong in Africa and we know exactly how to fix it. I just want all of us to sum up the courage to stand up and do the right thing so that future generations can applaud us and future generations can have a continent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's been such an honor to um, host you. Um, as they say, when something beautiful is happening, we don't know how time flies. We have 
taken over two hours of your time, but we are so grateful and um, we're so thankful as well that you made the time to speak with us. Um, I'm not sure if you have um, just one word or two for the management of um, Heritage um, Multimedia Television that made this um, conversation possible. I do, I do, I do. I am so proud of all of you for doing what you're doing. You have stepped into a medium that is so crowded, but you have done it undaunted. You have moved in and you have made an impact because you have been focused, you have been courageous, and you have been determined. I thank you for inviting me to come on this program. And I do know that you have spoken to so many illustrious sons and daughters of Nigeria and of Africa. And I just wish you the very best as you move forward. I wish you every success, outstanding success, because you deserve it. Because you're doing something that, that other people may have told you, you can't do it, it is too difficult, but you are doing it and you're making waves. I wish you well. Thank, Thank you, you all very Thank much. Thank you so much indeed. God bless you uh, on behalf of Heritage Television and our multitude of viewers. Um, once again, I'd want to, this is orange juice though, but I'd want to raise a toast to you as I one of our great elders, <laughs> one of our, empty. you know, great <laughs> elder states. Yes, ma'am. Elders on attaining your, your position as an elder stateswoman for continuing to carry on the legacy of Papa Ulawo and Mama Hichai Diaulo. For most importantly to me personally, being a proud daughter of Remo Kingdom that we both share our heritage of. Thank you indeed. May God bless you. Um, may you continue to arise and may you continue to soar and may God bless you with many, many more years ahead. Uh, we'll continue to reach out to you um, as and when we need to, because we know that your doors are open to us. And I pray that all that you've shared with us today, those that have watched, the eyes that have watched this, the ears that have heard, will be able to take nuggets of wisdom with them and try to translate their lives to being better people better human beings and loving one another just as you have advised us to do god bless you ma'am thank you indeed for being one of our legends on odua legend tonight and for being my guest on arise conversations god bless you indeed thank you very much i'm proud of you thank you ma'am <laughs> ladies and gentlemen we've been speaking for over two hours with the one and only Dr. Ambassador Olato Kumbo Awulo Dusumo, the last daughter of um, the late sage, Chief Obafemi Awulowo, who was Nigeria's first, Western Nigeria's first premier, and his um, wonderful wife, Mrs. H.I.D. Um, Awulowo. Um, we hope you've been able to take on some nuggets, as I said. Uh, the beauty about what we do on Heritage Television is you can go back and watch again. We're on all the social media platforms. We're on Facebook, we're on um, Instagram, we're on Twitter, and of course on YouTube. Um, I hope we've been able to do justice to this conversation. Um, we'll take time to look at all your comments and your questions. And if there are any questions that you need us to direct to uh, Dr. Tokumbo, I will order some, we will do so. And if she has um, responses for you, we'll let you know. Thank you again for being our guests. Thank you to our team, our technical team, um, Mr. Ade Whiskey Thomas, his beautiful wife, Oluri um, Esther Thomas. Um, thank you also to our 
Partners, Yoruba World Congress, Mr. Tajuddin for being here with us, and each and every one of you who's tuned in to listen, to watch, and to support. As I always say, do take care of yourselves and each other until same time, same place. Continue to arise as agents of positive change. And to Nigerians, I say, happy Democracy Day. God bless you all. Thank you. A book can go where you can't. It can be used for study, research, and practical life application. It documents your persuasions and impacts much desired knowledge. Even God sent his son but left his book. Featuring books written by Apostle Courage. Revelation and Relationship, a book for the spiritual hungry, which unveils the person of Jesus and brings you closer in your work with God. This book empowers your hunger for his presence and takes you to a new place in God. 100 Reasons Why I Hate Poverty This book unveils the perils, kinds of poverty but unveils heaven's plan of unlimited wealth and blessing for the believer. If you're concerned of not just being blessed but being a blessing to your generation, this is your book. Forgiveness, God's Roadmap to Heaven. This book tackles head-on the iniquity of unforgiveness in our lives and gives us practical keys to launch us to a new life that forgives like God does. If making heaven matters to you and you need help to let go some things, get this book now. God's Weapon of Mass Destruction. This book brings to light 14 weapons God has given every believer against our arch enemy, Satan, the devil, so we may constantly be able to live a life of victory. Every intercessor needs this book. Lesson from the Furnace of Affliction An encyclopedia on knowledge. This study guide brings divine answers to some of life's unspoken questions. In this book, you will learn about the danger of discouragement, the twin brothers to heaven, the accusing spirit, lessons for singles and demarried, intensive school of ministry sessions, and lots more. The principles taught are challenging and revelatory. Next to the Bible, this will be your favorite book. 12. Ironic Benefits of an Enemy Reveals the wisdom in dealing with people and how to unveil ulterior motives and 12 things you can benefit in seasons of ferocious attacks. This is the book everyone is talking about. I strongly believe in investing in knowledge. Your spirit man is the greatest investment you should invest in. What it took somebody five years to know, you can know in two hours. Buy one for yourself and buy extra copies to bless somebody else. These books will change your world. There is always something you don't know. The best gift to give to a child is the gift of knowledge. The best investment of your life is the one made in your mind and spirit. Get your copies now and for your friends. Available online at Amazon.com, JGMSite.org, AllNationsChurches.org, or test 214-335-2380. Get your copies now.
You are specially invited to our 11th year Lady to Lady online conference. The theme is the overflow, taking place on Saturday the 4th of July 2020. Time is 5pm UK time. Location will be online. To register, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Lady to Lady Global. This is who you are. You are the light. To join the conference or you can follow us on our Facebook page, Lady to Lady Conference. Invite your friends and invite your families. We wash, we wash, we wash.